Hello again. Hope you're ready to talk more about astronomy. That's what I'm going to do. This lecture is about galaxies, broadly speaking. Last time we talked about our galaxy, the Milky Way galaxy, so now we're thinking a little bit broader. I was going to break this into two lectures, like some of the other chapters, but we're just going to go with one longer one. So if you want to stop at some point and come back to it later, feel free to do that. I guess you're free to do that with anyone. Do what you like. Start out with a pretty nice picture here. This is of a galaxy, uh, sometimes called the Fireworks Galaxy, NGC 6946. It's a very pretty looking thing. So on the left is like the image taken in the visible range of the spectrum, and we see the nice sort of spiral and spiral arms. Looks like this might be an unbarred spiral. It's not really much of a bar in the middle, or spherical right in the center. And on the right side, these are this is an image taken in the X-ray portion of the spectrum. It's a much higher energy electromagnetic radiation, and you can see some very bright points, like the very center of that galaxy is emitting a lot of X-ray radiation. There's also various other points around, and even the spiral arms themselves are glowing in X-ray, not purplish. So this is a spiral galaxy, sort of like our own galaxy, the Milky Way. So we'll talk more about spiral galaxies, but we're also going to look at other kinds of galaxies. A couple other categories that we put galaxies into. But first, a little bit of background. As you hopefully understand by now, space is really, really big. So we try to look at things outside of our galaxy, which is already enormous, right? 100,000 light years across or so. Try to look outside of that. Anything outside of our galaxy is already very far away. Very hard to see. Like even our nearest neighbor, it's a rather large galaxy in itself, the Andromeda galaxy. Even though it's close, it's quite large for galaxies, it still barely looked like much more than just like fuzzy little dot for a long time to astronomers. And this photograph here is of the Great Andromeda Nebula. Right? So before people realized that these fuzzy dots that they were seeing were actually other galaxies outside of our own. They just call them nebulas. Right? Basically, for a long time in astronomy, anything that you looked at that wasn't a really nice sharp point of light, uh, we just call it a nebula. So that's why the word nebula is all over the place. Andromeda Nebula. Clouds of gas throughout the galaxy are called nebula. And at the end of a low mass star's lifetime, puts off this kind of cloud on the outer layers of the star, called that a nebula. This is why all these things have the word nebula with them. It was basically, if you weren't a straight-up point source, tiny little dot viewed through a telescope, just call it a nebula. Which I think actually means cloud, basically, in Greek or something like that. So there are people who had different ideas about what some of these things were, um, but for the most part, the general consensus up until like the 1920s was that our galaxy was basically it. Right? Things were roughly within the volume of our galaxy, like within a few tens or maybe a hundred thousand light years from us. So it was in the 1920s where this guy Hubble was doing observations with sort of the latest and greatest telescope at the time. I think it was in Mount Wilson, LA somewhere. And he was actually using pulsating variable stars. He was using those things to measure distances to objects. And when he did that and measured the distance to the Great Andromeda Nebula, he found out that it was much further away than it ever could be if it was going to be within our own galaxy. So this was the first sort of resounding evidence, in science at least, that there was other galaxies beyond our own. On the last slide was a photo of the Andromeda Galaxy in 1904, I think. A much more recent picture of Andromeda. Pretty astounding to think about sometimes how far we've come in technology of telescopes in a pretty short period of time. So Andromeda, as I've probably mentioned before, is also a spiral galaxy. Um, it's about two and a half million light years from us, so pretty far away, but millions of light years is still not actually that far away when we're talking about the universe. Andromeda is like our neighbor, our neighboring galaxy. And actually in this picture, we can see some satellite galaxies for Andromeda. So I told you about the Milky Way and how it has some satellite galaxies. So these are like smaller galaxies that are gravitationally bound to the Milky Way. So they're kind of stuck in orbit around the Milky Way. 
and those were like the large and the small Magellanic clouds, so we call them. Here, um, sort of below Andromeda and in the middle-ish of this picture is a pretty large, fairly large, uh, bright area. Right? That's actually a galaxy or satellite galaxy for Andromeda. I think that's M110. And then above Andromeda, just a little on the left, not too high above, so that was another fairly large blob of light. Uh, that, I believe, is M32, another satellite galaxy to Andromeda. Pretty small compared to Andromeda. So just to remind you of some of the features of a spiral galaxy, we talked a good bit about this stuff last time, where if you're looking at it from above, let me see the spiral arms. If you look at it from the side, you see it's actually fairly flat, or at least the very visible stuff is flat, but actually towards the center and around the center, there's a sort of bulge. And then there's this, you know, sort of sphere above and below the disk of the galaxy that we call the halo. And there are mostly old stars and like globular clusters in the halo. And I'll just mention too that, you know, that whole sphere, the halo of the disk, is also permeated by, what I was telling you about, is dark matter, or what we think is dark matter. So here's another spiral galaxy, NGC 1300. This is actually a barred spiral, right? So the central, really bright region actually has a sort of rectangular bar shape. And the arms on this spiral galaxy, there aren't quite as many arms as we've seen like in the Milky Way, and like Andromeda. Right? There's really only two very prominent arms in this image, um, but they're still spiraling around the center of the galaxy. So this is what we call a barred spiral galaxy. So when you look at spiral galaxies, visibly at least, they appear mostly flat sort of disc-shaped, and they can range in size quite a bit from the smaller side, 15,000 light years across, to on the larger end, 150,000 light years across. And remember the Milky Way is towards the larger end, 100,000-ish light years across. And also, I'm not sure how much I've emphasized this before, but when we talk about the size of the galaxy, usually we're talking about like the easily visible part, Right, like for the picture down here, so almost like where the image is, or where the image cuts off. But we found that there's actually a decent amount of interstellar gas, like cold interstellar gas, that's still part of the galaxy, it's just not very visible, and tends to extend out a decent ways past the visible sort of edges of the galaxy. So this size range is technically just like the really visible parts, and the much less visible stuff can extend out a bit further. As far as the mass of galaxies like this, of spiral galaxies, somewhere from like a billion to a trillion times the mass of our sun. And luminosity, you know, like how bright the thing is, how much electromagnetic radiation is being put out by the whole galaxy, anywhere from like a hundred million to a hundred billion times the luminosity of our sun. That kind of said before, when we're talking about galaxies, and also like the formation of galaxies, it's still somewhat mysterious overall, like how galaxies form, why we have these spirals, why there's these other kinds. And in science, a lot of times when you're trying to learn about something, when you're trying to figure out how something works, what makes it do the things it does, what makes it be the way it is, one of the first steps is usually just like looking for sort of like physical characteristics that are different and starting to classify things by how they look different or how for like galaxies how their masses are different or for how bright they are and broadly you can say it's just like what do these things look like do they separate into nice sort of classes of like oh there's a lot that look like this a lot that look like that so we're still sort of at that phase when it comes to talking about galaxies and galaxy formation one of the things we found is that a lot of galaxies look like spirals if you look a little bit more Digging a little bit deeper, we found that those kinds of galaxies have these general properties usually. But what about other galaxies? So we also see when we look out other galaxies, they don't really have the spirals, but they're generally sort of like spherical or maybe in like a cigar, or like blimp sort of like shape, or like basically like ellipse, ellipse, elliptical. So we call those elliptical galaxies. So on the left is one elliptical galaxy. Looks so like it's dubbed ESO325G004. Very exciting. In fact, in that image, 
as it points out, there are a couple of other just sort of roundish blobs of light, or ones that are like maybe a little bit uh, more squished ellipses. There are a few other elliptical galaxies in that image too. On the right here we have another picture of different elliptical galaxy, and I guess from other observations or from some careful observations of this galaxy, it seems to be that this one actually formed from the collision of two spiral galaxies sometime long ago. Also just to point out that the one on the left is technically what we would call a giant elliptical galaxy. So we'll see elliptical galaxies in size can range quite a lot. And on the much bigger end, call them giants. A general thing that astronomers do. Here we have another image of an elliptical galaxy, IC2006. This elliptical galaxy is about 35,000 light years across. 35,000 light years, pretty big, but you know, maybe only a third the size of our galaxy. Some general properties are, like I said, they're usually like spherical or sort of like cigar kind of shaped, elliptical. Um, they seem to mostly contain much older and redder stars, but also globular clusters, which again are also made up of really old stars usually. And there's not a lot of dust, you know, interstellar dust, or any sort of like glowing nebula. So that's as opposed to in spiral galaxies, those arms that we usually see very easily are because there's a lot of glowing gas and nebulas in them, and very bright stars there too. So in elliptical galaxies, you don't really see any of that kind of stuff because there's not really a lot of just dust and these glowing nebulas floating around. In terms of the size, like I said, they span quite a large range in size. Anywhere from three light years, which is only like the distance from our sun to the nearest neighboring star, to something like 700,000 light years. So up to being very large. That's like four or five times as large as the largest spiral galaxies. And on that very large end, um, there's not a lot that we've found that are on the really large end. Most of these are smaller, like the light years to tens of thousands of light years across. But some of them are in these really, really large hundreds of thousands of light years across. And those are the ones that we generally call giant elliptical galaxies, or the giant ellipticals. Being that they range in size quite a lot, they also range in the amount of mass quite a lot, from, you know, some like hundreds of thousands of times the mass of the sun, so like 10 trillion times the mass of the sun. And similarly for luminosity, they just, just a pretty wide range, anywhere from a million to like a hundred billion times the luminosity of our sun. So this astronomer, uh, Hubble, I mentioned him already, I'm going to come back a couple of times. Like I said, he was working with sort of like the latest and greatest telescope in the 1920s. And because of that, he was sort of one of the first people to be able to start resolving the physical differences in galaxies, right? Like how they looked different. And like I said, one of the first things you do is you start trying to classify these galaxies into the categories of how they look. So we already have the overall difference that I was telling you about, which is like spiral galaxies versus elliptical galaxies. There's one other category we'll talk about in a minute. But within, say, elliptical galaxies, we made these subcategories that basically is just saying like how squished the ellipse looks. So that E0 is an elliptical galaxy, but it's very spherical. E3 is sort of like a squished a little bit. E7 squished even more. You get more towards this like cigar shape. And then in terms of spiral galaxies, separated them into ones that have a recognizable and solid sort of bar in the center versus ones that don't, unbarred. And then within those categories, unbarred and barred spirals, they sort of separated them into ones that, you know, have a lot of that swirl going on versus not much of the swirl. So SA is a class of unbarred spirals that are really sort of wound up, right? The spiral arms swirl around a couple of times. You go to SB, still an unbarred spiral, but not so wound up. The spirals don't go around quite as much. SC, unbarred spiral, these spiral arms don't even really wrap around the galaxy entirely. And these are just all the kinds of galaxies he was seeing. Same sort of thing for the barred spirals, right? SB, S capital B being 
R and spiral. A is uh, one that has its spiral arms wrap around quite a lot. SB, little b, not so much. SB, c, not much at all. So jump back. If we look back at this one, this might be like an SB, big B, right? Barred spiral, and maybe C, right? These arms aren't even wrapping around fully. Yeah, so that one would probably be classified as that S, capital B, C. Like I mentioned, our understanding of how galaxies form is still pretty fuzzy. And seeing some of this stuff, like elliptical galaxies and spiral galaxies, you know, some thoughts might come to mind of like, oh, well, maybe one kind of turns into the other, or one's an early phase of the other, or vice versa. And yeah, I mean, those are interesting ideas, but it turns out, you know, people have had those ideas, and we tried to check out whether or not that makes sense, whether you make uh, observations, and test those kinds of theories. And none of those theories have really held up very well. So how these different galaxies evolve is still a bit of a mystery. And one thing that really complicates this whole matter is dark matter. If you remember back when I was telling you about dark matter in our galaxy, we think, based on like the rotation of things in the outer edges of our galaxy, we think that about 95% of the total mass of our galaxy is dark matter. So this is a huge portion of the mass and the matter of our galaxy that we know very little about. So it's also very likely and almost certain that dark matter plays a big role in the formation and the evolution of galaxies too. Since we don't know much about it, it makes it very difficult to get a handle on how galaxies form and how they evolve. There's one other class of galaxies to talk about, and that is basically anything that doesn't fall nicely into a spiral or an elliptical. It's a very inspired name. These are irregular galaxies. I'm not going to talk too much about those and say at least that these irregular galaxies are generally on the smaller side of galaxies. Typically, you know, a few tens of thousands of light years across. On the left is one irregular galaxy, NGC 1427A. It's about 50 million light years away from us, and it's about 20,000 light years across. But if you look at it, definitely no spirals, and it's not in a nice sphere or sort of ellipse. Nebulous, amorphous, we just call it irregular. It doesn't fit into the spiral of the elliptical category. It's another irregular galaxy, ESO 338-4, uh, which is about 100 million light years away and something like 60,000 light years across. But again, not really elliptical, not really spiral, it's an irregular galaxy. It turns out some of the galaxies I've told you about already are also irregular galaxies. Those are the Magellanic Clouds. Right? These are satellite galaxies to Milky Way. Some pretty pictures of them here. Um, they're only visible in the southern hemisphere. So the image on the left is of a telescope. I thought it said on there where it is. And I think it's probably in the Andes somewhere. It's in, in South America. And in the sky, in that image, you actually see the Magellanic Clouds. The image on the right is just a little bit more detailed image, just looking at the clouds themselves. So these are just a couple of irregular galaxies that are right near us. But if you look at them, again, not really spiral, not really elliptical, they're just irregular. So we got these kind of main classes of galaxies, spiral, elliptical, irregular. The next sort of thing that astronomers want to do is try to measure the total amount of mass of these galaxies. For spiral galaxies, it's a little bit easier. I sort of sketched out last time how we do that for a spiral galaxy. We look at sort of how fast things are rotating around towards the edge of the galaxy, and given Kepler's law, it relates the rate that something orbits to how much mass it's kind of orbiting around. We can estimate the mass of a galaxy. For a spiral galaxy, it's kind of nice because all the stuff in the spiral galaxy is basically rotating in the same direction. So we can just kind of look out towards the edge, measure the rotation of the things that are up near the edge, use Kepler's law, get a nice estimate for the mass of that galaxy. For elliptical galaxies and irregular galaxies, it's a bit tougher, mostly because things aren't all orbiting kind of in the same way anymore. Right? In elliptical galaxies and irregular galaxies, the motion of the stars and also the interstellar medium, gas and dust, can be all over the place. It can go in all kinds of directions.
But with it, we still came up to measure the mass of those galaxies basically has to do with looking at the spectral lines or the spectra of the whole galaxy and the fact that stars inside of the galaxy are moving in all kinds of directions means some of them are moving away from us, some of them are moving towards us. The ones moving away, their light is a bit red shifted. The ones moving towards, their light is a bit blue shifted. It's going back to this Doppler shift. And the effect of all that is when we look at the overall spectra of the galaxy, any spectral lines will kind of just be broadened out. Right? Some of the stuff is kind of shifting that line towards the red, some is shifting it towards the blue, and overall it just ends up making it broader. Kind of a tricky idea, um, but that is just to say that basically by looking at the spectra of a galaxy overall and how broad the spectral lines are, we're able to estimate the mass of elliptical and irregular galaxies. This is another very pretty picture, M101 pinwheel galaxy. It's about 21 million light years away from us, and it's almost twice the diameter of the Milky Way. This is just a nice little table summarizing some of the properties I told you about of these different galaxies, different kinds of galaxies. So if you look at, say, like the mass of spirals versus ellipticals versus irregulars, then, like I point out, ellipticals easily have the widest range of masses, 10 to the fifth, like 10,000 to something like 10 trillion times the mass of the sun. Regular galaxies, 10 to the eighth, it's like 100 million to 10 to the 11th, 100 billion times the mass of the sun. Then again, in diameter, ellipticals also have the widest range, anywhere from 3,000 to 700,000 light years. Irregulars, generally pretty small, 3,000 to 30,000 ish. As far as the kinds of stars that we tend to see in these different kinds of galaxies, in spiral galaxies, we tend to see a range of older and younger stars. Elliptical galaxies, generally just old stars. Irregular galaxies, old and young. And as far as what amount of interstellar matter or interstellar uh, material is in these kinds of galaxies, it Spiral, we are in a spiral galaxy, we got all kinds, gas and dust. Ellipticals, apparently almost no dust and very little gas. Right? Not a lot of the interstellar medium there. Irregulars, well, it's irregular, it varies. Most seem to have a good amount of gas, but some have very little dust and some have a lot of dust. So these are some pretty basic properties about these kinds of galaxies that we see. Something else then that is very interesting to look at is where are these galaxies in relation to us? So like how far away are they? Which gets back into talking about how we measure interstellar distances and now intergalactic distances. To remind you that one I've already told you about is using these pulsating variable stars. And the main kind of variable star I told you about was a Cepheid, or something we call a Cepheid variable. And when I was telling you about all that, you know, Cepheids was like towards the further end of distances that we were able to measure. At that time I was telling you, or I told you a bit about the sort of cosmic distance ladder, where near, very near stuff you can measure very well with radio, and then a bit further you can do with sort of parallax, and then further than that you start to do stuff with like the um, HR diagram, and then further than that even was these variable stars, these pulsating variables. And so the image on the top here is looking at another galaxy, M100, and a sort of close-up of a portion of that galaxy. We're observing a Cepheid variable star, and it's uh, sort of pulsing. Right? So on May 4th, not very bright. May 9th, it's getting brighter. May 31st, quite bright, and then it's probably going to start to dim again. And I'll remind you that the reason those are very useful it's because we found out that their peak brightness, their peak luminosity, was related to how long it takes to go from being dim to bright to dim again, the period of this pulse. So using this Cepheid variable, we able to estimate that this galaxy is about 56 million light years away from us. And in fact, this kind of distance measurement will allow us to measure things out to about 100 million light years. So this is pretty far, remember? Our galaxy is about 100,000 light years across. Andromeda is something like two and a half million light years away from us. 
so that distance is out pretty far. Not nearly, though, as far as we can measure with these Type 1A supernovas. So I told you about these a little bit already. We were talking about the depth of stars. So these Type 1A supernovas happen when a white dwarf has a companion star, and the companion star is close enough, or maybe it goes into a red giant phase, where its materials uh, starts to get pulled into the white dwarf. And if it gets pulled in fast enough, then the white dwarf can grow to a, a mass of about 1.4, or like one and a half times the mass of our sun. At that point, gravity overcomes the electron degeneracy pressure, collapses the whole thing, and it explodes spectacularly. And just a quick reminder, type 1a supernova, and I told you at the time, these things are very useful because they are extremely bright, which means you can see them from very far away. And since they all happen in a similar way, right, they're all white dwarfs that go over that limit of a mass of about 1.4 times the mass of the sun, then when they do explode, the peak in their brightness is very similar, right? Very consistent brightness. So very, very bright, and when we watch it happen, we actually know pretty well what its peak luminosity is, how bright it actually gets to. Remember, if you know how bright something actually is, you just look at it, measure its apparent brightness, how bright it seems to us here, that can tell us how far away it is. So these Type 1a supernovas, extremely useful, um, also sometimes called standard candles or standard bulbs, and they allow us to measure distances out to like 10 billion light years, very far away. We'll get to this later, but that's getting fairly close to the edge of what we call the visible universe. Um, the image up here is of a Type 1a supernova that's happening near its sort of post galaxy NGC 3021. It's very bright, practically brighter than that whole galaxy is. Pretty cool image, too. Like, if you look closely, you can see a whole host of other galaxies in the background of this image. Some look like spirals, some ellipticals, maybe one or two you can see in like irregular galaxies. Got a lot going on in that image. Pretty cool. So going through the process of sort of like classifying galaxies and seeing how massive they are, seeing how bright they are, we ended up sort of stumbling across another method for measuring the distance to galaxies, specifically to spiral galaxies. So as I told you, we can sort of measure or estimate the mass of a galaxy from how fast stuff is rotating around it, or how fast the galaxy sort of rotates overall. Something that was very useful was notice that the mass of the galaxy is also generally very much related to the luminosity of that galaxy, right? How bright it actually is, how much electromagnetic radiation is being put off overall by a galaxy. So once this was kind of noticed, then it gives us a way of estimating the actual luminosity of galaxies, right? We found that there's this really nice relationship between the mass and luminosity of spiral galaxies, so measure its mass, we use that relationship to find its luminosity. And again, if you know its luminosity, you just go and measure its apparent brightness, and you can calculate its distance. This technique uh, is known as Tully Fisher, which is named after the astronomers who sort of put it together. And it works out to about a billion light years. So not quite as far as the but if you remember I told you like this cosmic distance ladder, it's called a ladder because you're sort of using one distance measurement or method to measure distance in order to verify sort of the next method up. You kind of use one rung of the ladder to step up to the next one. Right? So all these kinds of distance measurements help us uh, make a stronger ladder that reaches further and further out into the cosmos. Distance ladder, it's not a literal ladder. So just to note that really not very well understood why this relationship is the way it is, but it just is what it is. Right? This is what we call a empirical rule. Right? It's not really based off any theoretical understanding. It's just like when we go and make these measurements, this relationship is found to be true. And so if it's found to be true and all these different times we go and measure it, then we can use that relationship for places that we don't really know. So we kind of check that it, it does work by measuring the distance to galaxies in other ways, if we can, right? So maybe another galaxy has like a Cepheid variable going off. 
right? So we're nicely able to measure the distance to that galaxy. So we then know the distance to the galaxy, we just measure its apparent brightness, right, it looks to us, and we can calculate its actual luminosity, right? So this is the luminosity that we would calculate by going sort of that route that we know works fairly well. You we then go ahead and measure the rotation of that galaxy to estimate its mass, and then use that relationship for mass to luminosity to estimate its actual luminosity. If those things match up, then this is sort of a way of testing this Tully Fisher uh, distance measurement. And so we did that, or we do that, right? Test what luminosity we expect versus what we would actually get with other techniques. It just seems to check out, right? We don't really know why, but it checks out. So one last thing to talk about, now that we're thinking about galaxies, sort of intergalactic distances, and measuring stuff about other galaxies. Something that comes up is this sort of big surprise that came about, partly as related to Hubble's work, um, but also other people were kind of pointing at this stuff earlier too. So what is that? Well, there was an astronomer before Hubble, some 30 years before Hubble was doing his big stuff, like in the 1890s, Slipher, Slipher. But he set out to measure some stuff about the spiral galaxies, or some nearby spiral galaxies. He didn't actually know that there were spiral galaxies at the time, I didn't know what he thought, but the general consensus was, remember, that these spiral galaxies were just nebula that were inside of our galaxy, right? They were still just little fuzzy pots. They called them spiral nebula at the time. So they couldn't really resolve them very well at the time, but they could still look at the spectra coming from them. So Slipper was basically just taking measurements, and I think a pretty painstaking process at that time, to measure the spectra from these different spiral galaxies. And basically what he found is that almost all of them had a rather significant redshift, where their spectras were shifted towards the red. Remember, when you look at a, a spectra from like a star or a galaxy, it has these spectral lines. And the pattern of these lines is from different elements and ions that are in that thing. And we know what those patterns are very well. So if you look for a specific pattern, but that you find that pattern shifted towards the red from where it should be, that tells us that that object is moving away from us. Redshift means moving away. And the further to the red that that pattern is shifted, the faster that thing is moving away from us. This is what he found. Pretty much all of them were moving away from us. There were only a couple of them uh, that he found the spectra for blue shifted, meaning they moved towards us. So again, at the time, they thought the, all these things were in our galaxy. So it was probably just kind of a confusing thing at the time. I'm not really sure what to make of it. Until a few decades later, here comes Hubble, and this sort of settled the idea that there actually are other things outside of our galaxy, other galaxies. And he also goes about making very similar measurements to what Slipper was doing 30 years before. Right? Going and measuring the spectra from various galaxies. And again, much better equipment, was able to measure the uh, spectra of a lot more galaxies. And his results were basically the same overall picture that Slipher got back in 1890, for the 1890s. Nearly every galaxy that you look at the spectra, its spectra has been redshifted. It means it's moving away from us. And not only that, Hubble was able to measure the distance to some of these galaxies too, and found that the further away a galaxy was, the more its spectra had been redshifted, being the faster it was moving away from us. So the further away these galaxies are, the faster away they are moving. So we usually write down this relationship, something like this, where the velocity of a galaxy, technically you would call it its receding velocity, the velocity that's moving away from us, is equal to some constant, which we call Hubble's constant, times the distance that that galaxy is away from us. So by measuring the receding velocity and the distance to many different galaxies, astronomers have tried to estimate what Hubble's constant should be. Still some intention exactly, but for the most part, current estimate for Hubble's constant is something like 22 kilometers per second for every million light years that a galaxy is away from us. The sort of takeaway 
that we get from this then, you look far away from us, like not right around where we are, you look far away, everything's moving away from us. You look even further out, everything's still moving away, it's actually moving away even faster. The takeaway from this is that the universe is expanding, right? And that is to say that space-time itself is expanding, getting larger. You talked a bit about space-time and general relativity before, but it's still a very tricky thing, confusing thing. So I'm going to use a couple of uh, pictures, sort of analogies, to try to understand why we get this picture that uh, space-time is expanding. So in this example, think about you know some ants that are sitting on a ruler. For some reason, that ruler is stretching. So if we imagine you know, that ants are like our galaxies. We're going to imagine that we're sort of like the ant at two centimeters, right? We as in like our galaxy, Milky Way galaxy. And then the other ants, A, B, and C, are other galaxies. So A is fairly close to us to begin with, right? Two centimeters away. B is a bit further, five centimeters away. And C is even further about 10 centimeters away. So if we grab each side of this sort of stretchy ruler and spread it apart, obviously us sitting at two is gonna see the other ants move away. They're all gonna start moving in this direction. But if we think about it a little bit, you can see that the further away that an ant is, the faster it's gonna be moving away. How do we see that? Well, we think maybe we just stretch this ruler over a minute from here down to the picture here. So the ant at A, that was two centimeters away from us, is now uh, four centimeters away. Meaning that in that minute, it moved two centimeters. So its velocity, the speed that we would see it moving away from us, or that first ant on the left sees it moving away, is like two centimeters per minute. Now maybe think about uh, ant B. Ant B originally was five centimeters away from the first one. Now it looks like it is about uh, 10 centimeters away. So over a minute, it moved five centimeters, meaning its speed, we could say, is five centimeters per minute, more than the closer one. And the further out you go, the larger that velocity gets. For the ant C, looks like it started out about uh, 10 centimeters away from the first ant, and then stretched, well, the ruler doesn't extend that far, but maybe when it stretches, it ends up at like 22 centimeters. So it ends up uh, moving about 10 centimeters, meaning it's speed, the velocity that's receding from the first ant, is 10 centimeters per minute. So none of the ants had to move anywhere. Right? The only thing we did here was think about starting with the ruler and then stretching out that ruler. And the fact that that ruler is sort of like the space that these ants are in, the fact that it's stretching, results in things moving away from each other. But more than that, the further away something is from, say, us, like the ant at 2 centimeters, the faster way it will move. This is just another example or another sort of analogy to use to think about uh, things moving away and moving away faster the further away they are. A bit closer to the actual picture, because this is like a 3D sort of image now, where you think about this dough for some bread and for some reason it has raisins in it. But if we think about or imagine that we're sort of sitting at one of the raisins in there, Right, the one sort of in the middle and the left, and what happens as this bread um, rises, improves, right? It's going to expand, it's going to expand. All of the space in between the raisins is expanding. And in fact, the further raisins, the further away a raisin is from us, from there, the further away it will move when this spread expands. Right? So the faster it's moving away from us. And the original picture, right, the close one was 5 centimeters, and then in that time it expanded, it went to 10 centimeters. So it only grew by 5 centimeters at distance. The one that starts out as 10 centimeters away, it ends up being 20 centimeters away. So it moved 10 centimeters. It moved twice as far as the one that was closer to us. This is all trying to give you the idea and show you why if space expands all over the place, sort of equally everywhere, then things are going to seem to move away from us. And the further things are away from us, the faster they're going to be moving away. So I'll finish up just by showing you a graph that also shows the same kind of thing I've been telling you, which is about Hubble's Law and the expanding universe.
So this is the sort of plot that you get when you look at the distance galaxies are away from us and the velocity that they're moving away. So for galaxies that are maybe something like 10 million light years away from us, Hubble's law is sort of that line here, go up to that line, that galaxy is going to be moving away from us at about 220 kilometers per second. It's pretty fast. But Hubble's law says the further away you get, the faster these galaxies are going to be moving away. So all the way out here, it's say like 200 million light years away. But Hubble's law says that galaxy will be moving approximately 4,400 kilometers per second away from us. Very fast. To point out too, this is also sometimes known as the Hubble limiter. I don't know how to say that. Hubble, whatever that word is, law, also named after a different astronomer who suggested that this kind of relationship existed, but I guess his paper didn't get read that much. It's Belgian and never really translated outside of the small journal that was published in Belgium. Okay. Nowadays, at least you get some recognition. There you go. So this is all very interesting. It's saying that it seems that our universe is expanding. This also, in fact, gives us a way to measure the distance to distant galaxies. I should point out that this moving away from us uh, only really starts to happen when you get outside of our kind of close neighborhood. Like Andromeda is our sort of galactic neighbor. It's not really moving away from us. The space in between us and Andromeda is just not expanding very much. There's not enough space to be expanding there. Same thing with like you know, the, uh, our satellite galaxies, the Magellanic Clouds, um, those things aren't moving away from us. So we, Andromeda is actually coming kind of towards us. So this kind of law, or this motion of distant galaxies, is just that. It's for distant galaxies. Right? Once they're like 10 million, 100 million light years away, and beyond that. But if we are looking at galaxies that are out there, this now gives us a nice way to measure or to estimate at least the distance to those distant galaxies. Basically, if we look at its spectrum, and we see how much its light has been redshifted, which shows those spectral lines that redshifted, remember that shifting, the amount that that shifted, is related to the speed of that object. So from that redshift, we can say how fast it's moving away from us, and we can use Hubble's law to estimate the distance to that galaxy. Like if we were to look out, measure the redshift of some galaxy, it tells us that that galaxy is moving about 4,400 kilometers per second away from us. Hubble's law then says that galaxy is about 200 million light years from us. It's another technique for measuring distances that are like intergalactic, maybe beyond that. Right? The last thing I wanted to say here, as I sort of mentioned, there's like a bit of contention or still uh, not quite settling of the sun of of Hubble's law and Hubble's constant. One of those contentions, or one of those issues that's still trying to be worked out, is whether or not Hubble's constant is the same throughout the whole history of the universe. So if that constant is the same, or has been the same throughout the history of the universe, that means is that our universe has been expanding at the same rate the whole time, right? as long as it's been around. But if that constant is different, or has been different in the past, or will be different in the future, then the expansion of the universe might be changing. Right? It could be expanding, and that expansion could be speeding up. Or it could be expanding, and that expansion could be slowing down, and then eventually it's going to start contracting. I believe we'll talk more about this kind of stuff, and that idea of what's going on with the expansion um, in one of the last chapters that we're going to look at. But just to say now that in late 90s, there were uh, measurements made of very distant galaxies, right? really, really far away. I remember that's also seeing galaxies really long ago, right? Very early on in the history of the universe. It's complicated, but the results of those measurements actually tell us and told us that not only are things moving away from us all over the place, at least when you get far enough away, the rate that they're moving away is growing, right? So it's kind of it's tough to think about, like we've already tried to tell you about space expanding and how that affects what we see when we look at distant galaxies. Now I'm telling you also that that expansion is not constant, it's accelerating. I wouldn't worry too much about the whole accelerating part right now. The book mentioned this in this chapter and we will, I think, 
pretty sure talk about it more later. So just kind of hint um, at that right now. I'll have to come back to that point. So that's it for this lecture about galaxies. Um, the next time I think we're talking about some specific aspects of galaxies we've found, particularly uh, things called quasars and called active galaxies. Right. Well, I'll see you later.